Hi everybody and, and welcome to this webinar on comparative education. I'm Sharon Parkinson, I'm a Publishing Development Manager and co-host representing Emerald Publishing. So this webinar has been developed in partnership between the International Higher Education Teaching and Learning Association, or HETL, as it is known, and, and with Emerald Publishing. Um, and if you want to find out more about either of these organisations, please look out for a follow-up email after the event, because there will be links through and resources um, to, to both. Just a couple of housekeeping and practical points before we start. All delegates have been muted, so if you have any questions, which we do encourage, please use the questions box in the panel on the right-hand side of the screen. We'll try and address all questions during or towards the end of the session. And if you have a question for a specific panellist, then please be sure to include that panellist's name in, in your comments. I'm now going to hand over to Professor Audrey Fork, who is the Director of the Community Engagement Programme and Chair of the Department of Applied Human Development Community Studies at Merrimack College in the US. She's also the County Director for the US Northeast Region um, on behalf of HETL. So Audrey will moderate today's session. So over to you, Audrey. Thank you so much, Sharon, and thank you all for participating in our webinar today. The content of today's session focuses on comparative education, a critical topic and of great importance for us to understand similarities and differences between educational systems across the globe and to help us identify promising practices and emerging trends and also to identify growth areas in the field of education. I am joined right now by three panelists and hopeful that we will have our fourth panelist join us shortly. We are having a little bit of technical difficulty with our fourth panelist, uh, but for now we have our three panelists who are here with us today to explore how higher education institutions across the world practice comparative education research and how they are taking active steps to use their research to inform policy and practice. So I'm going to name all four of our panelists uh, and of course I'll identify uh, our panelist who is not quite yet with us, will, who will hopefully be with us shortly. So we have with us Dr. Annalee Adams, who is Associate Dean of International and Access Programs at the University of California, Davis. Dr. Nikolai Popov, who is a professor of comparative education at the Faculty of Educational Sciences and Arts for Sofia University in Bulgaria, and Dr. William Smith, senior lecturer in education and international development at the University of Edinburgh. And then our fourth panelist who will hopefully join us is Dr. Terry Kim, professor of comparative higher education and visiting professor at the University of East London. Thank you so much, all of you, for being with us today to talk about uh, comparative education. And I'll start by asking each of the panelists to share a bit about themselves and their work in comparative educational research. And for this question, we will start with uh, Annalie and then uh, have Nikolai and then William respond. So Annalie, thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time zone you are in the in the flow. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you in this discussion this this time. Um, as Audrey, in her introductory words, indicated, this is a very important topic for the flow, not just for individual countries, but for the flow, as we are redefining our future, not just after the pandemic but all the interconnectedness that we have seen during the last decades to have evolved. My role and my passion for education comes simply because education transforms individuals, societies, countries, and the globe. It's a very simple uh, perspective that I, I upheld. Of course, it's not the only one. Uh, my work, my concrete work that I do, of course, as an associate dean, I do a lot of administrative work, but my role is academic. So I am really um, very closely connected to the 
international networks and the programs that I create with my team members, of course, is really looking at what are the practices that we can deploy, but also be mindful of not imposing what values in our own system we should take to other countries, but really be receptive to the fact that, that education in particular comes from values, evolving societies, historical perspectives. And, and so my practical work really ties into what we do in comparative education. The administrative part is the secondary part. It's the education and creating education and making access to education a core for any university is very close to me. So thank you, Audrey. Thank you so much, Annalie. Nikolai, please share a little bit about yourself and your background in comparative education. Hello, greetings, greetings from Sofia, Bulgaria. Uh, my first experience, actually, I met comparative education more than 40 years ago in the early 1980s, when I was a first year student in the education program at Sofia University. Comparative education uh, was included in our curriculum, and my first impression was that this is the most interesting discipline. In Bulgaria, it was a time of socialism, and our knowledge about what was happening in the world was strongly restricted. The Iron Curtain was everywhere around us. The lecture course in comparative education was something like a small open window to, to the world of other countries. We studied... Uh, there is some mic... Excuse me. Okay. Um, we studied the history, theory, and methodology of comparative education, but also the education systems in many countries in the West and education reforms worldwide. Some years later, at the end of my university study, I decided to write a Master of Education thesis in the field of comparative education, and I had a special appointment with one of the Bulgarian comparativists who had been on a study visit to the International Institute of Teachers College, Columbia University, in the middle of the 1920s. 1920s. When we met, he was a very old man. My first question to him was about where his interest in comparative education came from. And I still remember how he told me. Young man, comparative education was my first love with science. He didn't mention words like interest, challenge, career. He said love. After a very interesting conversation with him, I then decided to join the wonderful world of comparative education. Over the past 40 years, I have been working in the field of comparative education. My two doctoral degrees were in the field of comparative education and all my academic positions were in the field of comparative education. Regarding this webinar, I decided to join it because it is always interesting to see what colleagues from other countries do, what they think and what their priorities are. Comparative education is a very intensive, innovative, very flexible field, and we can only benefit from sharing opinions. Thank you. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much, Nikolai, and it's wonderful to hear that passion for the work. William, can you please share a little bit about yourself and your background in comparative education? Sure. Thanks so much, everybody, for having me here today. I want to thank Emerald and Hedel for the invitation. Um, I think most of it, similar to the others, is having something that drives you in the field is, I think, quite important. And so to me, it was definitely a sense of inequalities out there. So I did my undergrad in sociology and saw vast inequalities within the states when I was doing my undergrad. 
and then importantly took a class on globalization and realized that the differences in the states are really minimal compared to what we see globally. And that drove me eventually to get uh, a master's in international development and a PhD in comparative education and education theory and policy at Penn State. And I was interested really in focusing on the barriers to access. I saw education as an important fit for social mobility, but also important for so many other outcomes and developments. So for health, for income, for ideas of citizenship, for um, understanding the world better. And so was quite interested in that relationship between education and development and focusing on the barriers to access and the policy barriers, the other structural barriers to access. That led me, um, before I was at the university, at, at Edinburgh, my current job, to work a little bit in civil society. Um, I've also spent some time at the OECD and UNESCO's Global Education Monitoring Report. And so in addition to kind of looking at barriers to access, I've also been quite intrigued by kind of the global local relationships, which is an important part of comparative education, um, kind of the global discourse, global goals. I spend a lot of time looking at the SDGs now. Um, I was at the GEM report for the first four years following the SDGs, so quite interested in how global discourses are done and how they're translated at the local level. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to a good discussion. Wonderful, thank you so much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so all of you have hit on a number of different benefits and positive attributes of comparative education and uh, some of the things that I've noted uh, during our uh, your introductory rem remarks already are just the global perspective, of course, um, and with that global perspective, um, some understanding of equity, issues and access issues um, as they pertain locally uh, and globally um, and certainly historically and then uh, and then in our present day um, and how we can use those issues to affect policy changes and ultimately use those issues for as Annalie said social transformation um, so really wonderful points and uh, ideas that you've all raised already just in your introductions um, I'm going to turn to our first question uh, which is um, comparative education can help bring about positive change and can bring positive solutions to educational problems. What do you see as being the greatest benefit or benefits of comparative education? And I see that uh, Terry Kim has joined us. Um, Terry, if you'd like to give a brief introduction and try uh, to respond to this first question, that would be wonderful. Um, thank you very much, Audrey. Um, sorry for my delay in the technical problem. Um, well, going directly to your first question, um, I think um, it is important to recognize that compar comparison is not a method or even an academic technique. Rather, it is a thing, it's a discursive strategy. Um, as Benedict Anderson pointed out, a uh, good comparison often comes from the experience of strangeness and absences. And comparative education is conventionally understood as studying the differences between the educational systems of different nation states with a virtual usefulness for end users. Um, and the centrality of nation states in comparative education, namely methodological nationalism, still widely accepted to compare the education systems and policies of different nation states um, with the goal of identifying best practices and promoting educational development. Um, that is the typical rationale for comparative research um, commissioned by many international agencies, think tank, and many national governments still. But behind this approach, uh, there is an underlying assumption that uh, each nation state has a unique culture and history, and in the legacy of romantic nationalism and the advocacy of state-led education in ameliorative developmentalism. Um, so, um, so I think there is an, um, um, the, the long-standing banal assumption um, 
that has been the purpose of comparative education research should be robust and relevant for policy formulation and policy evaluation. And there is an element of contradiction in the purpose of doing comparative education. One is for epistemic enlightenment, and the other is for common goals and idealism, such as excellence, equality, and justice, um, especially uh, for social justice. So I call the formal an epistemic problem finding comparative education that enable us to see a riddle or a paradox not previously thought of by anyone else. And the latter um, I call a real world problem solving comparative education that are of policy interest and relevant to administrators and serving what uh, Robert Cowen called the straight jacket of normal puzzle comparative education. As a comparative educationist committed to liberal education and epistemic enlightenment, I am getting tired of this typical assumption of doing comparative education ultimately for its usefulness for end users only. And I find the biggest benefit of comparative education pedagogically in the ontophenomenological inquiry about the intricate relations of um, entanglement between knowledge and identity and between home world and alien world. Uh, yeah, I will stop here. Thank you so much, Terry. William, uh, I'd love to have you respond to this question. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, so I think I would agree with Terry that the traditional assumption that comparative education is really us comparing at the nation state level for benefits of the end user um, is a limited view. It's important. Um, I, I take that approach sometimes. Um, I think you need to be cautious with it. But when I was looking at this question, I think there were a couple of things that spoke to me. So one, which I think is getting a little bit to the uh, epistemological approach that Terry's taking here is really one of the big positive things that I think you can come from comparative education is really a respect for different experiences and knowledges, right? So that sense that, yes, why I, my history um, is grounded in a certain experience and certain family experience and background, that it's not the only one and there's a quite a large variety of experiences out there and ways to understand the world. I think that's important. And it also encourages this type of intercultural communication. So it is about opening up the world and understanding each other. Um, and I think valuing each other. I think that's quite important. And for me, the other thing that comparative education can do is it really highlights the importance of context, right? So we comparative education oftentimes um, mistakenly leads to a bunch of copying and pasting policies across different contexts. And I think what we, do need to look at more, and I think what comparative education can do is highlight the importance of context where we have the same policy or initiative that behaves differently in different contexts, and it gets us to asking why. Why is it differently here? You know, what part of the system um, influences this policy differently? Why isn't this policy working in the same way, in the same behaving in the same way in this context? So I think that's interesting. And on the flip side, I think an interesting question is about the times, and it's, it's often, but the times where our policy actually looks similar in these different contexts. So oftentimes neo-institutionalism would talk about this as isomorphism. Um, so when and where, but when we talk about that, also thinking about, well, why and who might benefit from, from that, um, I think is quite important. So I, I think, one of the things I can see from comparative education isn't necessarily the cookie cutter, let's take a policy and place it somewhere else. But when that, when we do move policy or transfer policy, why does it behave differently? And really what is driving it? What's the importance of the context in this? So that's for me. Thank you so much, William, and uh, both of you for those uh, thoughts about how to really use uh, comparative education in a really deep and critical way to uh, understand uh, um, the differences and similarities between our nations and our communities worldwide and to develop a more 
uh, a greater appreciation for and respect for the different cultures and ways of practicing education across the globe. Nicolet, I'd like to give you an opportunity to respond to this question about the benefits of comparative education. Thank you. Uh, comparative education has different forms of existence. Uh, for example, the first form is the academic form. I mean comparative education as a field of teaching at colleges and universities. Uh, comparative education as a teaching discipline or an interdisciplinary topic or a master program of comparative education. The second form uh, is uh, the scientific form. I mean any kind of theoretical or empirical research in the field of comparative education. The third form is the education policy decision-making device. I mean comparative education used by high-ranking officials for policy decision-making. And the fourth form uh, is international education large-scale comparisons forum. I mean international studies like PERLS, PISA, TIMS and others. These different forms of existence of comparative education have different content, different aims, different methods and different applications, and different benefits. Uh, I will say uh, just some words about the benefit of uh, the academic forum. We can have comparative education at uh, colleges and as a teaching field. We can, of course, furnish our students with knowledge on education systems abroad and factors that, in, that determine their development and can also provide them with comparative data, comparable data on education in other countries or give even the results of comparative studies that would be interesting to them or even teach them how to perform comparative studies. But in my opinion, the greatest benefit of the academic form, of um, the academic comparative education form, is to help students create comparative thinking, making and improving a comparative mind, forming a need to comparatively approach to education fa facts or any education problems. Thank you. Thank you so much, you Nicole. So much. Annalie, can you please I, uh, share your thoughts? Sure, thank you, Audrey. Um, I wonder what to, how to summarize the eloquent statements that my colleagues have made, but I tried to aim for a very simplified version of this that resonates with me. And I would like to follow Nicolay's words about the value of educating the students to think differently, perhaps comparatively. And I, I take us back to the fact that, of course, science, we all aim for objectivity. That's our key principle in all sciences. Uh, what's really interesting about education per se is that it has factors from politics, history, society, cultural values that all stem into education policy. That policy then permeates to all levels of institutions that practice education, whether it's a state, whether it's a municipality, school board, higher education, university, et cetera, et cetera. They permeate those values, the political decision-making, all that funnels through all the levels. So when we think about science and objectivity, we can get data from very strict scientific practices, but how are those factors played into the decisions that are being made to inform policy or academia or how we educate our future generations. I think that that's where we circle back to the, to the comments that have been made earlier. But in a very simplified matter, we all have the privilege 
to help our students to think how did their education system in whatever country they are in on the globe, how did it evolve to be what it is today? And how does that potentially grow into something different in the future? And how much do those values still regulate how and where the future is? So thank you. Thank you so much, Anna Lee. That was a wonderful conclusion to that uh, question. And I think it kind of moves us forward to the next question, which is about uh, the application of comparative education to teachers and students and classrooms. Um, and I know some of you made a comment, well, it's not just about that, and clearly that's the case. Um, but also many of you spoke about how important it is for our students to be learning um, the uh, approaches of comparative education, both uh, for um, helping uh, for, for themselves a greater cultural and international perspective, for uh, helping their students to have that perspective, and also for being able to use data uh, to inform uh, policy and to inform practice. Um, and I'm wondering um, what uh, you feel um, are some of the best ways that you and others uh, who are faculty uh, and uh, folks doing comparative education research, scholars, how can, uh, how can we use this um, to really make a difference in classrooms and in schools and in education? Um, I will let Nikolai take this one first. Thank you. Uh, this is a very, very large topic of discussion, and um, uh, I will be very short. And uh, I would like, I would just like to share um, some experience in this regarding this question. Uh, in practice, uh, some Bulgarian experience. In practice, teachers can use some of the above mentioned benefits while attending international school projects between schools in different countries. Today, in Bulgaria and all countries in the European Union, there are many, many, really many options of international cooperation projects between primary or second and secondary schools in the European Union. Both teachers and, and, and students can participate in such international projects. And if teachers have received some knowledge in the field of comparative education during their university study, they can definitely better understand the situation in foreign school systems and su successfully cooperate with teachers from other countries. Um, uh, I, have, uh, uh, I have received uh, uh, information from uh, many teachers uh, who were my students um, at Sofia University and um, and they shared that the knowledge in comparative education they received during their university study is uh, very useful for them uh, uh, while uh, they, uh, they participate in these international school projects uh, financed by different European Union programs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikolai. And I'll turn it over to Anna Lee. Thank you. Um, I think Nikolai brought up some really good points. Collaboration across the borders, using case studies in your classroom, um, having students really look into broadly other countries really broadens their horizons to understand what William spoke about earlier, the contextual factors, 
that really play into the education policy making, decision making at any any level in education. But I also think that it teaches students critical thinking skills. And when our teachers, provided the, those we teach become teachers, uh, not all of them, well, some of them will go to other occupations, of course. But when teachers have good critical thinking skills, they also think they don't just assume that what is presented to them in their given context. Sometimes you have a very regulated curriculum. You don't have a lot of freedom to, to actually um, go outside your assigned curriculum. But by bringing to your classroom practice the critical perspective that helps even your students that you're teaching at the third grade level to see the world in a different way. And that, that helps the student to become, it, it's multiple layers of people that the impact really is when we teach teachers to think comparatively, when we have the analytical thinking skills in terms of how do you read the data, what data points are relevant to any given culture, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that there are, there are very many benefits that we need to feature in that regard. Thank you, Audrey. Sure, thank you so much. That's fabulous. Um, Terry, I'd love to give you a chance to respond to this question. And I wonder too, if you might add whether um, you uh, know examples of ways that comparative education research have been pointedly used uh, to um, affect uh, student learning, student retention, and other kinds of educational issues uh, that are uh, important, again, at the local as well as global levels. Oh, we're not hearing you, however, Terry. No, so sorry. Maybe we should skip to William for now. Okay. Um, all right, so let's see what I can do. I think so far we've had some really good responses. I especially like the critical thinking, because I think when we're talking comparative education, but really any class, uh, in higher education that almost getting students to ask the key questions is more important to get them to answer. So the fact that they're inquisitive and they're asking good questions, they're thinking about the underlying assumptions. And so I often talk in my classes about developing like critical consumers of comparisons. So thinking about the comparison, but also why is it appropriate? Why is it important? Um, what is actually being compared is quite interesting. And then, We've had a lot of conversation on kind of the exposure to other systems, to other examples, to other um, education practices. And I think that's really important because I, I get a little nervous when I think about outcomes just being test scores. And mo most of my work that I'm best known for is around the global testing culture and how that shapes everything else. And so I get quite nervous when we think about, okay, it's just exams, it's just assessment and so forth. I think there's really important outcomes as far as understanding cultures and systems and approaches and so forth that are that are there for our students and you know exposing them through case studies as a teacher you can look at make sure the case studies you have are diverse and thinking about different types of education informal formal non-formal but also different levels of education from different cultures and backgrounds um, and one of the ways that you can also bring in diversity is by bringing in guest speakers and so thankfully, like today is a great example of the fact that we can have people from all over the world come in. So if um, if you're not familiar with it, if you want to bring in some diversity and, and expose students to other uh, examples or experiences, then bringing in somebody remotely be a guest speaker, I think is great. And then the final thing for me is um, I'm thankful that I'm currently working in a program that has a fairly diverse student population. And we need to think about diversity as more than just across nations, right? So there's diversity in experience. So we have some older students and younger students. We have diversity within country as well. So it's not just by nationality. But I think encouraging open discussion, having students share their own experiences is important. Uh, it just shows that we value their experience and it does promote peer learning. Um, so I think those are some of the things we can do in the classroom. 
Thank you so much, William. Terry, I'd love to give you one final opportunity to see if we can hear you to answer this question. No, oh, oh I'm so sorry, Terry. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and move on to the next question. Um, uh, I uh, loved all of your responses and thank you so much. It's really fascinating to hear each of you share your perspectives uh, on this work and the importance of the work and how this work translates into the classroom. And I very much appreciate the, what I would say are really collective responses and uh, energy and synergy around the importance of using comparative education in classroom context to expand students' worldviews in a very general kind of way, just to be exposed to different cultures, histories, political, social contexts, uh, and to be able to think about similarities and differences, and also to think about the fact that just because we do certain things in a particular way, it doesn't mean it's the only way to do them or the best way to do them. Um, so all of those are really uh, wonderful um, themes that you all have been highlighting and uh, I think are so important uh, and really uh, helping to elevate the value uh, of this work uh, in, in our society and societies. Um, so uh, next uh, is a question about challenges of uh, comparative education. Uh, so comparative education in the international context is challenging. Uh, having an international comparative education research agenda, uh, pursuing a research agenda in an international context it has its challenges. And how do each of you uh, address those challenges. Um, so uh, I think um, let's start this time uh, with William and um, uh, then we will go to uh, Anna Lee and then Nikolai. Thank you. Thanks, Audrey. Um, so I think I'm gonna just identify two challenges that I see um, in either my students' research or my own research as well. And the first is just being a little bit more cautious about the comparisons we are making. So I think oftentimes in comparative education, I see there are issues with making what I would talk about as appropriate comparisons. Mm -hmm. And this is exemplified sometimes in the media where they really oversimplify differences and they put things into kind of binary us versus them categories. And I think part of this is due to the fact that our, uh, what's understood as the reference societies um, have changed over time, right? So previously, um, let's say in the, 20th century um, that we are comparing usually countries or regions with similar histories and cultures. And now we're looking at comparing everybody to a different reference society, which is usually our best performing systems, right? So now we have everybody compared to Finland or Singapore and these performance are usually based on league tables, and global learning metrics or international tests like PISA. Um, and these, positions on tests have then become the only definition of quality. And so I think we need to be really careful when we start comparing um, countries in this manner, because it's not quite clear why we would compare a country like Peru, for instance, with Shanghai, a high performer, and PISA. Um, so I think we need to do be more careful in how we justify our comparisons. What is being compared at what level? Why is the comparison appropriate? One of the things that I really like and I use in my class is, uh, it's not quite from comparative education, but I think it's a very useful chapter. It's uh, Peter Lohr's 2011 chapter. Um, the chapter is called Methodology of Comparative Studies. And he talks through really a couple of different designs for comparison, a most simple design, a most different design. And these are fairly intuitive designs, but trying to really isolate what we want to compare um, within our studies is important. And briefly, the other kind of personal challenge for me when I'm working in the field of education and development um, is recognizing that I am a white male from a colonizing country. And it's, so it's really important to recognize my own privilege with that. Um, and I try to break that down some by making sure that I work with partners in the countries that I'm working with that we're trying to co-construct research, um, making sure that they're driving the questions and that I'm not assuming questions or assuming knowledge there that I'm recognizing my own privilege, I'm reflecting on the positionality, and that that's happening in the planning at the very beginning, but also in the conducting and the writing of my research. So those are some of the things that are challenging for me. 
Thank you so much, William. That was amazing. Okay, and I told you the order, and then I think I forgot the order. Did we say Nicolay's next? No, you finally. Said, I'm okay. Okay. Yeah, it's very difficult to follow William. I mean, his his response was very insightful, and I and I second, and I'm not going to repeat what you already said because those are the points, key points. Understanding your own privilege, especially if you come from the Western world, is something that has to be at the core of your, your agenda. You have to honor, you have to listen more than say. That's very critical in the formulation uh, phase of your research, if you're talking about your own. If you're instructing your students to conduct research, that is equally important to highlight that critical concept. I, I, I so William's words so resonated with me. Um, I would like to, if I briefly may, um, give an example. I taught educational leadership in a doctoral program, and my my students were school principals. And once they learned that I was born and raised and went through my my uh, university uh, undergraduate degree in Finland. They all said, we are going to go to Finland and copy the Finnish system and we're going to implement that in our district. And I said, ooh, 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 not quite so. You know, it really was a key point, William, because I, I think that it, it really, it behooves us as educators to pause and really instill to our students what this is about and not to go and just think that you can go and copy a system and implement that, that it's really the evolution that has impacted how your educational system got to where it is. And that goes back to the critical thinking and also to what William spoke about earlier, the inquisitive mind, mm -hmm. informing, listening, and then formulating your questions. Luckily, as a solution to some of this is we have wonderful networks of comparative education in the world and we have partners and I think that we have a lot to contribute to the world the African continent the co developing countries there's a lot that we can give so that's that's my points order to add on wonderful thank you so much both of you and again lots of very common uh, ideas and common themes around the idea of participatory research and really identifying um, our own privilege uh, and working uh, in true partnership and um, uh, disrupting uh, kind of systemic inequities uh, through our practice of research in more equitable uh, and respectful and uh, ways. Uh, Nicolet, would you like to take the opportunity to respond to this question as well? Yes. Uh... It is very difficult to continue after William and Anneli, but anyway, uh, I, I, will, I would like to focus on three challenges. The first, um, uh, the main challenge to comparative education is to be relevant to the current situation in the own country, as well regionally, internationally, and globally. Uh, comparative education should be strongly relevant to current education needs and problems. I have seen how students are much interested in the comparative education course when we discussed topical issues and how they merely lose interest in aspects which are far from their daily education life. The second challenge uh, is finding new units for comparative research. The old and the current units that are usually compared are not enough and are not interesting to students, teachers, and policy makers. By old units for comparative research, I mean uh, the, uh, the classical aspects of uh, uh, school systems, uh, aims, uh, leadership or management or governance, no matter what we will study, uh, finance, structures, uh, curricula, teacher training. Mm -hmm. uh, by current units, I mean uh, globalization, uh, migration, 
uh, minority groups, vulnerable groups. Uh, we need uh, we need finding new units for comparative research. And the third challenge is, uh, in my opinion, is uh, developing closer research or even professional connections between specialists in the field of comparative education and specialists in other comparative sciences. Um, uh, uh, comparative education is, uh, is, uh, is uh, very often more comparative than education. Uh, so uh, uh, we need um, strong research cooperation uh, with specialists in other comparative sciences. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Uh, and uh, Terry, let's see if we can hear you this time. We'd love to hear your voice again. No. Oh, my. Okay. I'm so sorry, Terry. Uh, um, Nikolai, thank you for your comments uh, in uh, regard uh, to uh, challenges. Um, and I think your points about the meaningfulness and the relevance of the work we're doing is spot on. Um, and, you know, identification of where do we go from here, I think, is kind of what you're getting at. And that is also the next question. So that's a good segue. Um, we are getting tight on time and we do want to have at least a few minutes for um, those who are listening to us today to share in the chat questions they may have. So I'm going to encourage folks who do have questions to start putting them in the chat so they'll be ready uh, in a moment or two. And I will uh, uh, invite uh, our presenters to each say just a very quick word to our final question before we open it up to our participants. Uh, and that's the question of where we're headed. So how do you see comparative education evolving? What are some notable trends that you're seeing in the field of comparative education? And again, we're going to try to keep these responses relatively uh, brief. Annalie, would you like to share first? Thank you very much, Audrey. Um, obviously, things that resonate with my heart are things that are close to what I've done in the past. I think that if I think on a global level, for example, uh, developing teachers is critically important. I don't think that that should go away. Teacher development, new leader development, that should continue to be on the agenda because that's where the future is going to rely on. And, and instilling them with the best practices and best research methodologies and ongoing uh, tools is critically important. Um, I think that an area that I am particularly interested in seeing how that moves forward is really the, the sort of global perspective, how to help developing countries. Um, United Nations sustainability goals call for quality education for all. So it's been spelled out. It's not my novel concept. But it is something that I think is so conceptual at this point that it's being done. But really, then, how does that pertain to your particular institution and to your teacher education you know, um, uh, program, for example. How does it pertain? How is it in, inserted into your undergraduate in teacher education or education program or whatever you call it? There are so many different names. And how does it go through the curriculum? What is the red, red string that ties in these comparative perspectives in your academic curriculum is very important and interesting to me how we infuse that and make sure that from the freshman year on, we have that critical thinking, analytical thinking, based on sociological things that we know what's going on in the world. Because it goes back to Nicholas' key point, and this is, this is where I'm gonna close off. It's making it relevant, making mm -hmm. it relevant to our current stage where we are. So thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Nikolai? Uh, about the the trends, yeah. Yes, right. Yes. Trends. Yes. Where is okay. the field headed? Okay. Um, uh, I will focus only on 
only on two visible trends. The first one is establishing a variety of sub-comparative education fields, specific in interdisciplinary comparative research fields. For example, I and a couple of colleagues from different countries have been working on establishing a new comparative field, comparative school counseling. On the one hand, the content fully depends on school counseling problems, on, but on the other hand, the research methodology is from comparative education. However, this is not a simple application of the comparative method in school counseling matters. It is a well-organized combination between school counseling and comparative education. Uh, this is the first trend, establishing a variety of sub-comparative education fields. Um, and the second trend uh, is, uh, and actually this is my con conclusion, um, there is no one comparative education. Uh, there are many comparative educations. Comparative education is what comparativists do. There are many definitions of what comparative education is, but in practice, comparative education is what we, the comparativists, do. When I talk about comparative education to German colleagues, or to Scandinavian colleagues, or uh, to Australian colleagues, we actually talk in different, we speak in different languages. I mean different comparative education languages. We talk about entirely different disciplines. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikolai. Terry, would you like to see if your speakers are working now? No, no. Okay, William, uh, if you can please respond to this question and then we will move on to the... Yeah. So very briefly, I think there's, when I look at trends, there's, I think, two um, ideas or concepts that I think are going to be more prevalent in comparative education research in the future. I think if you're not familiar with Bartlett and Varbris's work in the last five years on comparative case studies, I think that's going to be more important methodologically in the field, especially what they talk about as a transversal dimension of their case studies, which is typically following a policy over time and context. Um, I think there's a lot of good stuff that's going to come out from that. And the second thing, which I think captures some of the ideas of futures of education and so forth, um, I think we'll start hearing more about potentially what uh, has been talked about in uh, business and leadership studies as a VUCA world. Uh, and VUCA stands here for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And I think coming out of COVID, but also looking at issues of climate change, looking at issues of refugees, we're seeing the need for more flexibility, rethinking about what education is, how is it delivered, and so forth. So that type of, of flexible response to uncertain times and disrupted education patterns, I think is gonna be more important in the future. Wonderful, thank you so much. Terry, one last uh attempt do you want to try to speak no 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 oh okay well i want to thank each and every one of you for uh all those wonderful responses uh your answers to this last prompt were amazing uh really great ideas about the future of comparative education focusing on the interdisciplinary nature opportunities for cross discipline uh, work related to comparative education and sub-disciplines, uh, the policy work, uh, and um, also just thinking about best practices uh, in teacher development, which of course is the heart and soul of education um, to benefit our teachers and our students. Uh, we have just a few minutes left and um, Sharon and Andrea, who are our friends uh, from Emerald, are here to assist us in uh, seeing if we have any questions from our participants. Um, and again, questions, uh, especially given the short time, maybe uh, you may wish to identify a particular uh, respondents, feel free to do that in the chat. Are we seeing any questions at this time? We, we are actually, more than I was expecting. So we've had quite a lot of questions. So I think we're just going to have to handpick a few at this 
point. Um, and what I will say is that any that don't get answered, I will follow up with the panelists and see if we can get some kind of written thing together that we can circulate to the attendees. So the first question, I think it's fair to just go in, in, in order. So the first question that appeared um, was somebody saying, well, thank you for the introductions and the invite. And um, from your extensive research, have you found a particular region that can act as a role model to other regions or are they all equally in need of development? So I don't know how you want to handle that, Audrey, whether you just want to have one panelists reply and then we can move on to another question perhaps yes i think that's a good idea um is there anyone who wants to take this one in particular would you like to take it william i mean i i can i think it's really difficult to think about you can learn everything from this particular region that you can copy elsewhere uh, i think it really is about what you're going to look for there are strengths in each region and each country and so I would think we need a, a lot more specificity around what exactly you're going for. Um, sometimes my students are coming in and they're thinking, oh, I'm going to learn so much from the UK system to bring back home. And there's that assumption. Uh, and so I think, yeah, I, I would be very cautious to think about, okay, yes, there is a role model region out there. There's not a role model region for everything. There's not a role model country for everything. Thank you so much, William. Okay, so another question. Um, somebody says this is very interesting, um, but is it not the norm that the West thinks their education is more superior than developing countries? Mm, similar kind of question, sort of. Uh, Anna Lee, would you like to take that one? Oh, I would love to. Of course. <laughs> Don't we do it in any other uh, aspect of life as well? Yes. And, and this is why we need comparative education. We need data, objective data, that proves us otherwise. It's that um, mindset from centuries ago, and that still carries out. And, and that ties back to my earlier point about cultural values and how important it is, as William also spoke to, to really understand the societal, the social aspect of these things. These are tied into decision making. Education is being decided upon uh, on, on core values. And if we have a very, very um, imperialistic perspective, what do you think? And, and you become blind and you don't see your own deficiencies because you just think that you're so, so awesome. And that's where we can really bring that value to our students to critically uh, learn them to think critically and read data. Thank you. Good question. Thank you so much, Annalie. Sharon, do we have time for a final or shall we conclude? Um, well, it, ha it has turned to the hour now, so I think it's probably best that we wrap up. Um, there are lots of other questions outstanding, but like I said, we will try and address these and send out a kind of follow-up email for the attendees so that at least all their questions have been addressed in some way or another. Wonderful. Well, I would love to thank you, Sharon. Uh, we're grateful to Emerald and to Hedel for sponsoring this uh, session and grateful to all of our panelists for their uh, really insightful uh, uh, responses and for just participating and sharing their wisdom and expertise with us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.